welcome back to another episode of Is Fits Happy. I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And this week we're discussing chapter 34, part two. Of let me let me think if I can see. Oh my gosh. I've looked into the crystal ball. It's uh-huh. called Oracle. Oh yes, the crystal <laughs> ball of last week. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta keep a running joke every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> Oh, a running joke of two weeks back to back is perfect. Perfect. <laughs> now, every once in a while, I make a joke about the title and it's like, you know, true. If I didn't, who would I be? <laughs> <laughs> My co-host yeah. and is Fitz happy and is he happy? We don't know. He's probably just he is. living in a mountain hut somewhere. He's in a cabin with his adopted son yeah. and deeply depressed. But <laughs> Nina is there, so... <laughs> Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll jump right back in where we left off uh, last week. Without further ado, let's jump back to the chapter. The serpent has now become free, and it is long enough to be able to reach the ground without falling to its death. Mm-hmm. But it is not trapped. able to read the wa- reach the water. Yes. Yeah. And it is dying. And knowing that, Wintro finds himself sort of coming back to his body and going to help. His entire body was reacting now. His eyes were puffing shut while his breath whistled in and out of his thickened throat. His eyes and nose streamed, his skin felt stripped. Yet he was standing and staggering to the edge of the fissure. His useless tattered shirt still wrapped one of his hands. He could see the green gold body of the serpent on the beach below him. He could feel her baking in the heat. He would go down to her. He starts down that narrow path, but ends up falling and uh, lands on the serpent's body. Breaks his fall, but uh, honestly, it's almost more. (laughs) He shrieks in pain. Too much. She was too much to know, and whatever coated her skin was eating his away. He rolled away from her to land on barnacle-crusted rocks. A wave rushed in, licked tentatively at his face, and rushed away. The water was a blessing to him, and he notices that his shirt that is covering his hand is soaked with the water. So he goes over to her, throws that on a gill, and she says, It eases me nonetheless. We all thank you, because he knows that it's only covering a small part of her head. Right. We? He mouthed the word, but did not think that was how she shared his thought. My kind. I am the last who can save them. I am she who remembers. Even now it may be too late. But if I am not too late and I can save them, we will remember you. Always. Take comfort in that creature of a few breaths. Wintro. My name is Wintro. The next wave reached them, went a little bit higher, but she's thrashing feebly and nothing's really happening. Selfishly, he wondered if he could roll far enough away from her to stop sharing her pain. His own was quite enough. Then it all seemed like far too much trouble, so he just kind of lays still. Yes. And we switch back over to Etta's point of view, and they hear the first scream when Rintro had grabbed the bar to begin with. And it's super spooky because it seems to come from nowhere and Mm -hmm. everywhere all at once i mean he's in a cave with a hole at the top of it so i'm sure it came from one side of the the mountain and above so it's kind of just echoing around the whole island and i'm sure this is where the others hear it as well right and not only that but we have wintro in a position where he is in the side of a cave that is hidden from view, even if you're in front of it. So kind of, it yeah. like is just naturally camouflaged. I want to say mm-hmm. from what it, around the corner from where the main path is. And, yes. Yeah. So there's no telling where this is coming from or where he even is. And yeah, apparently it's far enough away that they don't see the giant serpent coming out of the hole. Because so. remember, it's around the headland. Yes. So they're going yeah. around a corner. I'm imagining almost um, like if you're walking along a beach, it's a crescent shape. So they go around the tip of the crescent and it's around the other side. Right. So there's that cliff in the way. Yeah. So anyway, they are not seeing anything, but they are hearing. Mm-hmm. And it also notices that the tide is coming in and... 
this summer squall, this storm is kind of starting to blow in as well. There's a silence that follows that scream and Ed asks, what should we do? Kenneth looks around and says, continue to the alcove rock. And then he stops and stares at something and she looks where he's looking. The creature she beheld had not been there a moment before. She was sure of it. There, were, there was nowhere it could have concealed itself, and yet now, suddenly, it was there. The erect part of it was as tall as Kennet, and a heavier, slug-like body trailed behind it. As she stared at it, it flung out flexible limbs from its upper body. They were impossibly graceful, bonelessly unfolding with outstretched, long-fingered hands at the end. The fingers were webbed. Its body was gray-green and gleamed damply where it had, was not covered by a pale yellow cloak. Its flat eyes glared at them menacingly. Go back, it warned them. Go away, she is ours. The hissing, thrumming voice was thick with menace. Even the smell of the creature was frightening, though she could not think why. She only knew she wanted to get far away from it as possible. It was too foreign, too other. She seized Kenneth's arm. Let's get away from here. She pleaded, tugging at his arm. And Kenneth, of course, is standing there and he's like, no, it's fine. I got my charm. It's trying to it's, ensorcel you. Yeah, it's a magic trick. Is the reason Kenneth isn't affected as strongly because he's so forged? Possibly. He's still able to be affected by all this magic, but he is also able to fight it off. And he isn't trained on how to protect his mind officially. Right. But I feel like the charm does help. And that's because, so? yes, because it was awakened with his self, with close contact of him. And that's what centers you in the skill is reminding mm. you are you, right? Right, yeah. So I think something like wizard wood which is holds the actual memories of a person also the dragon that it is a part of right right is there and not affected by this because either the others can't affect the wizard wood or they're only directing it at the humans and don't think to direct it at the wizard wood or right. something i think that extra little thing is kind of centering him okay that's fair but being forged might help as well just you yeah. know not as prey to some of those emotions Right. Yeah, know. that was just a thought I had, a passing thought. But no, I like the centering of oneself through that wooden charm. It does beg the question, I wonder if the live ships can be right. influenced by skill, but mm -hmm. who knows? <laughs> Edda's trying to listen to Kenneth's words, but really can't. She's absolutely terrified, and she finally recognizes the creature's stench, and it's dead and rotting human and is just begging Kenneth, like, please, let's just run. Let's go. And she did not know where she got the strength to stand still and watch, but Kenneth baited the other with a courage she found unthinkable. Crutch tucked under his arm, he first stepped towards it. It raised itself higher, spreading its wormy limbs. She could see the webbing between its long fingers. Go back, it warned him. Kenneth only smiled and shrugged his shoulders. This way, he told her, and then starts walking back along the path right and she immediately is like oh good he's scared too he just doesn't want to show it obviously this is a good choice well she doesn't think that actually i think that's your impression of this she's just relieved that they're walking away she's very impressed with him she's like i can't believe he had the courage to stand there oh well, yeah i guess Kenna kind of kept glancing back over his shoulder at the creature she did not blame him but she could not bear to look at it and yeah, so I she's, guess, yeah. she's kind so of like I'm, imposing her own fears of like Kenneth obviously feels this scared too because yeah. he's glancing back at it but Kenneth's just looking to see whether where when it's it turns going. away yeah. where it's going <laughs> yeah okay so I guess I read that whole thing as like she's like oh my gosh he's scared too thank god yeah I think <laughs> she thinks he is a little bit but yeah I, I think she's also like I can't believe he's so courageous <laughs> at the yeah, same time yeah but it is really interesting that she is so affected by this i mean yeah. it makes sense but it does make me wonder all humans that go there are except yeah. for kenneth because he's so special yeah. uh, <laughs> no it makes me wonder though with what she's seeing of the other 
how much of that is real and how much of that is like glamour. Mm -hmm. And it makes me want to go reread the description that Kenneth has after he realizes it's glamour. Cause he does say that it smells bad. It just is stinky, not scary right. smelling. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I remember it seeming more like a frog person and this feels more like, a weird slug scary mm -hmm. monster yeah so i'm wondering that's why i wonder and they could all be different too that's also true they're abominations <laughs> true we'll have to see if the first one was also gray green yeah well yeah kenneth is staring after the other to see where it's going and then says ah now we know and we will beat the other to it because they move pretty slowly she glanced fearfully over her shoulder. The creature was undulating rapidly over the sand, yet for all its effort, it seemed to move slowly. Again, the wave of terror shook her as the smell of the creature overwhelmed her. She could not still her shaking. Stop being afraid, Kenneth commanded her uselessly. See how it hastens down the beach as soon as it thinks we are fleeing? Whatever it seeks to protect is down that way. Come, help me go as swiftly as we can. Can it please? It will kill us. Etta! Do as I say. I will protect you. Now come. And he takes off down the beach, moving like a long-legged creature, swinging on his crutch as he almost ran. Stone and sand shifted under him, but he compensated. And behind them, they can hear a cry of outrage from the other, and then there are more. And Etta can turn around and see that there are other others <laughs> yes. on the way and coming. And... She's also, as you mentioned before, surprised at how swiftly he can move when he puts his mind to it. Mm -hmm. She's almost like trotting to keep up alongside of him. There's a second scream. That's when he's falling out and landed on top of the serpent. And Kenneth blanches and says, that's Wintrow. I know it is. Wintrow, we're coming, boy. We're coming. Incredibly, he increased his pace. She loped at his side. The others flowed after them, humping their bodies along as if they were walruses. Some carried short, trident-headed spears. Her mouth was dry and heart hammering when they reached the end of the beach. There was nothing to be seen save the rocky headland rising before them. Kenneth glanced from left to right, searching for a trail or some sign. He threw his head back and drew a deep breath. Wintro, he bellowed. No answer. Etta's like, Kenneth, you know, the tide's coming in. The boat will be expecting us. Perhaps Wintro went back. And then they heard a shriek of pain. That it freezes, but Kenneth doesn't hesitate and wades into the water and starts to go around the headland. And Etta does follow. The others were still coming, and the sight of them kind of paralyzed her with fear. All was dim and gray as she stumbled through the waves after Kenneth. She clutched at his sleeve as much her guidance as to help him stand against each wave. And the summer squall has arrived as well now. So they are in the middle of a storm. They are going through a rising tide, wading into the water around rocks. They don't know what's on the other side. They just know that there's a shriek of pain. Right. Which also would be really hard in the best of circumstances. Right. And now there's rain and it's hard to see. And Kenneth has to worry about a crutch, which like at this point, do you think he just like has it floating next to him? <laughs> He's like <laughs> not even putting it in the ground. I don't know. It's crazy, but they... They are making their way downtown, walking fast, <laughs> <laughs> and they finally see Wintro and a giant serpent. Yes. yes. Around the headline was a short, headland was a short rocky beach backed by the black slate cliffs. Wintro's body rose and fell with the waves that washed past him. Next to him was an immense greenish yellow thing. Suddenly, it lifted a huge head, and her eyes resolved the contorted shape. It was a stranded sea serpent. Immense gold eyes swirled at her. Yeah, so she's now convinced Wintrow is dead. It's useless to wait. They mm -hmm. need to get back to the boat. She's hoping that they have not left them. She Still kind of under the spell of the others that they must flee. She's terrified of them. Yes. Let's get out of here. And she is willing to leave Wintrow. It is fine. Sorry for your loss, Kenneth. We got to go. And Kenneth is not letting them leave. She, He's pushing forward saying we have to go get him. He's re He just responded to me he yelling. He, he's not dead. He moved. There was so much frustration in his voice. He sounded almost grief stricken. 
And she's like, it's a trick of the waves. But then he shouts, Wintro, and this time the lifting of the boy's head could not be mistaken. His swollen mouth moved. Kenneth, he, mo- he moaned. She thought it was a cry for help, and then the boy dragged in a breath and cried out, Behind you, the abominations. So yeah, uh, Edda is just convinced, like, nope, we gotta go. Yep. Oh, I'm terrified, let's leave. <laughs> it doesn't it matter. Sucks to suck. I guess he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> and if he's not now, he will be. It's fine. <laughs> and Kenneth's like... He can't be dead. Yeah. Yeah, because... This is my younger self that I'm going to do right this time, you know? Yeah, this (laughs) is like his chance to rewrite Igret's wrongs. And it is really tense and emotional for Kenneth. And... And we don't get to see that, really, except in small glimpses, because Etta is so out of her own head that she can't really pay attention besides some small remarks about his tone. Yes, and... It's so frustrating. I want to know what Kenneth is thinking through this. I want to know what his thoughts are when he sees Wintro, what his thoughts are of, are they going to save him? I, I think, How annoyed is he with Etta? Like, yeah. True. He's probably very annoyed with Etta. Yes. But I think in my mind, what's going through his head is the, the railing against the world. Like, you can't do this to me. I have yeah. plans. My luck will prevail kind of thing. Yeah. Um, kind of what he shouts at the end, to be honest. Right. Just like, I dare you to stop me now. This is my destiny to be king. And I, this, <laughs> I'm going to yes. save Wintro too, you know. But uh, Wintro shouts the warning behind you, abominations. And a webbed finger hand wrapped bonelessly around her thigh. Etta screamed. Flat fish eyes stared at her from their frontal setting in a bald, blunt bald head. It gaped its mouth open at her, the lower jaw dropping, opening wide enough to engulf a man's head. She never saw Kenneth draw his blade. She only saw the knife slice through the elastic flesh. The limb stretched before it parted. The other other belched a roaring protest. It gripped at its severed stump. So Kenneth is like, pull yourself together, woman. Yeah. Please, God, pull your knife. Have you forgotten who you are? He turned from her in disdain to meet the next one. The question snapped something in her, or perhaps it was the feel of her knife's hilt in her hand. She pulls it free, lifts her head to shriek her defiance, that strove to ensorcel her, and slashes. So they fight back a bit here. Right. I do find it really interesting that he says, pull yourself together, do you forget who you are? Because it is really easy to interpret that as nice i guess for kennett <laughs> asterisk <laughs> but remember who you are yeah it's a very key phrase there yes yeah it does and that is part of the magic right is that you have to center yourself you have to think about who you are to keep yourself from being I, lost and i think that is right that the the feel of her knife hilt in her hand helped that too because that yeah. is intensely a part of her right and it does help and it does work and Kenneth's luck prevails in that way yeah, and yeah. happening upon the perfect phrase to say to get her to snap out of it, I guess. But they are now fighting the others. The others don't want to fight them, really. No. They want to get to Wintro and the sea serpent. Yes. They want to prod the sea serpent back to the shore because yes. they want to keep her. As they say, whatever comes from the sea does not leave the island. Mm-hmm. You cannot steal our oracle. She is our goddess. What is found on Treasure Beach must always remain. They surrounded the serpent. Some lifted menacing, menacingly the short jabbing spears they carried. What did they think to do? Slay the serpent? Hurt it somewhere? Whatever they intended, Wintrow was bent on opposing them. He had dragged himself to his feet, but how he could stand, Etta did not see. His body was swollen like a sea-claimed corpse. His eyes were slits beneath an overhang of puffy brow, but he opposed the waves to slog around the serpent and stand between her and her tormentors. He raised his voice. Abominations, stand back. Let she who remembers go free to fulfill her destiny. His words rang oddly, as if he spoke by rote in a language he did not know. The wave nearly knocked him down. The lift of it raised the serpent's bulk. Her coiling tail found purchase. She slid a short distance toward the sea. A few more and she would be gone. So, weird words that Wintra speaks there. Yes. He's 
I don't want to say that she is speaking through him because I don't think that is possible, first mm-hmm. of all. I think that he is so detached from his humanity at this point that he is just trying to remember how to operate things. And he is operating from a point of, I am outside my body. She is all that matters. And also kind of thinking, like, I am part of her life. <laughs> yeah. I I think I view it a little similarly, If but there's a little difference too and that i think that there is definitely some manipulation going on from the point of of she who remembers in some way like they're connected because she's sharing they're sharing and i don't know how much of that is inadvertent because he has touched the mucus exactly like i'm not yeah i don't know if it's on purpose or not i i feel like a little bit it has to be um, even if just from like a self-preservation point at right. point, just of help me. Yeah. And it's so strong that it's because of that connection. Yeah. yeah. That he is helping her. And so I think especially this like weird detached, I think what he is saying sounds weird because it is what he has learned through her. Not necessarily mm-hmm. because he's so detached from himself, I guess. And okay. Yeah, I I think the 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 specific phrasing of as if he spoke by rote in a language he did not know is uh, for me like he's so detached from his humanity and his body right now and linked through the skill or dragon magic or whatever that he's communicating through his mind. So using his voice like this right now is tough for him Mm. because he was so he dove so headfirst into this you know, skill stream or trance state, you know? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I don't really know. But uh, Edda's watching this whole thing, and as the others kind of come forward, he grabs his knife, tries to grab his knife and get down into a fighter's crouch, and that startles Edda back. It's like, I'm standing here not fighting anything with my knife in hand, and I'm not helping him? What am I doing? Yeah, so I thought this was really interesting. This and later when she's holding on to him in the boat, do you think? Edda might have a little bit of feelings for Wintro. Mm. I don't think so. Not beyond a friend. Okay. Really? Yeah. Um, I think because she explains it later, too, that this is like her first friend that she's ever had. Yeah. So it's just kind of confusing. And it's like, what am I doing? I do like this kid. So. Yeah. Okay. Why am I just watching? Right. And I don't want to make it seem like the only option is for a man and a them woman. Together. Yeah, yeah, they have to have feelings. No, but I, I was th- just Wintrow yeah. obviously has feelings for her, yes. but I think Edda just thinks of him as a friend. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. And seeing him, well, because she, especially because she sees him doing what she taught him. Right. And that really snaps it back of like, wow, that simple act right there. What am I doing? I taught him this to protect himself, but I can help him and I'm not. And I don't know. It's really sweet there. It it does show a friendlier side to Etta than we get. More compassionate. At yeah. Least. <laughs> yeah. It, not so fight or flight and yeah. self-preservation. Yeah. 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 No. So, yeah. But she does then go to fight. She is mm-hmm. trying to help. And so does Kenneth. Yep. Kenneth, Kenneth is, appears at, his, at her side afterwards as well. And he's kind of going a little bit more ham than she is. He is getting in there to get Wintro out. Uh, one of the others had grabbed Wintro, and Wintro kind of stood paralyzed by that grabbing, and the other was starting to drag him to the side. And all of a sudden, the serpent's head is arcing down from above them, and her jaw seized on the other, engulfing his head and hunched shoulders. She lifted the creature from the water and then flung it disdainfully aside. Wintro stumbled, thrown off balance by the struggle. Kenneth immediately seized his arm, stabilized him, said, I have him, let's go. Uh, Wintrow is still in that whole mindset of she must escape, don't let them trap her here. I have to protect her and help her. And Kenneth's like, she's going to do whatever she pleases, we gotta go. (laughs) She's fine. (laughs) Yep. The tide is coming in. So Edda's taking the other side of Wintrow and they're back in the water. They're trying to struggle back to the beach here. But the waves are coming in, the tide is up, the rain is really hard, the the squall is here. Yes, and it's a lot. So Etta is really struggling. She has Kenneth's crutch on one side, 
Wintro on the other. Kenneth is on the other side of Wintro, and she feels as though, or no, I guess he's connected to the crutch. So Mm -hmm. she's on either side. She has the men on either side of her, and she feels like this is just a lot. They are, Kenneth's telling her, go towards the shore, and she can't even figure out where the shore is. It's too rainy. There's too much happening. She feels like she's being dragged down by the two of them. Well, Wintro's in the middle, actually. To begin oh, with. Yeah, you're right. To begin right. with. Yes, it, that does end up later. But to begin with, Winter's in the middle of them and they decide, they're looking at the headland they're like, oh, we have to go deeper into the water to get back to the beach. This is going to suck because yeah. the tide's coming in. And of course, there's a struggle. Things are disoriented. And then all of a sudden, she just sees a crutch floating past, grabs that. And it's and Kenneth. then Kenneth's. Yeah. So Kenneth and Wintrow had let go of one another. And now Etta is in between both of them. Yes, thank you. Yep. She glanced back only once. The serpent was free now, but she had not fled. Instead, one by one, she was seizing the others in her jaws. Some she threw as broken holes. Other fell from her jaws sheared in half. Beside uh, beside Etta, over and over, Wintrow uttered a single word with obsessive hatred. Abomination. Abomination. Yes. And this, as rereaders, we know is because... The others are the byproduct of dragons who got too close to humans and then had a baby. Mm -hmm. Um, It becomes tainted. It's an abomination because it's not a pure dragon. Yeah. It is affected by the humans Mm -hmm. in the same way that humans can be affected by them. So it's the opposite of an elderling. Opposite of a rain wilder, I would say. Hmm. Because they're around, like, that dragon and, and growing things and not necessarily guided, you know? That's fair, but I feel like they wouldn't have ever been guided. But I guess that that still makes it closer to opposite of a rain wild. Yeah. Not exactly the same, but I'd say it was closer to that. Do you think the only reason these abominations are alive is because the dragons went out, uh, like, they don't exist anymore and so they yeah. couldn't destroy the abominations mm-hmm. yeah because it seems like all of the dragons hate these things yeah it's just kind of ingrained in them hmm. interesting but anyway our but, three are lost at sea yes the the large wave hits them and she's clinging to wintro and then grabs uh the the crutch as it goes past and kind of is connected to the other side of that He commands them to make for shore, but she was disoriented, flings her head back, uh, swings it around wildly, but saw only the sheer black cliffs, the foaming water at the base of them, and a few chunks of floating other. Serpent was gone. The beach was gone. It would either be pounded against the rocks or pulled out to sea and drowned. She clung desperately to both of them. Vivacia, Kenneth said beside her. A wave lifted them higher. She saw the crescent beach. How had they come to be so far from it so fast? That way, she cried. She felt trapped between the two of them. She leaned toward the shore and kicked frantically, but but the waves drew them inexorably away. Inexorably away. We'll never make it, she cried out in frustration. That way, Kenneth, that way, there is the shore. No, he corrected her. There was an incredulous joy in his face. That way. The ship is that way. Vivacia, here, we are here. Wearily at it turned her head, and the live ship came driving toward them through the pouring rain. She could already see the hands on deck struggling to get a boat into the water. They'll never get to us, she despaired. Trust the luck, my dear, trust the luck. And with his free hand begins paddling towards the ship. So they're caught in like a riptide or something, kind of drew them out to sea pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, We know that the tides are kind of messed up around other island in general. Right. There's some sort of current anomalies going on and a sunken elderling city that brings up the treasures from the elderling city to the beach. Yeah. But also things around the island for a while seem kind of messed up. Right. I'm wondering if part of the weirdness in the currents is from the elderling city below and the skill stone that would be telling everything around it, like keep me pristine or whatever. Oh, maybe. And then the 
water is trying to repel from that, making different currents that aren't natural. Yeah, that could um, be. But also, who knows? We also, I mean, there's no real evidence that as much skill stone is used as in Kelsingra, although there is still skill stone used throughout elder other elderling cities. So, I don't know. Hard to tell. Right. But either way, they're caught and they have seen Vivacia. She's coming to the rescue. Trying to, at least, yeah. And we switch back over to Wintro again, who is not much help for telling us what's going on because... Dimly aware. He's dimly aware, but he is now on the ship, or a boat, I guess. So a rescue boat has come to get them mm-hmm. off of Vivacia to get to them more safely, I guess, than she could, or quicker. Mm-hmm. And he is dimly aware of what's going on. There's a man telling him that he has to stay alive and a woman to stay telling him to stay awake yes. shaking him uh the man kept yelling at the woman to keep his face up keep his face out of the water he's drowning can't you see so they're still kind of like floating in the water at this point i think yes and then eventually uh we get into a rescue boat here but he can't he's not really aware of anything but he's so connected to the memories still of the serpents he remembered so much. He remembered his destiny as well as recalling all the lives he had been before this one. Suddenly it was all so clear. He had been hatched to be the repository of all memory for all serpents. He would contain them until such time as each was ready to come to him and with a touch renew their rightful heritage. He would be the one to guide them home to the place far up the river where they would find both safety and the special soil from which to create their cases. There would be guides awaiting them at the river to protect them on their journey upriver and to watch over them as they awaited their metamorphosis. It had been so long, but he was free now, and all would be well. So he's in She Who Remembers Thoughts at this point, remembering what she remembers. And this is where that rescue boat kind of pulls up alongside them, said, get Wintrow in first. He's unconscious. Right. Also, I do just want to take a quick pause Whenever she who remembers says, I'm she who remembers, that is like a big moment because Mm, as first time readers, I guess we kind of skipped over it because we're not first time readers. But I was just thinking as first time readers, this is who the serpents are looking for. This is why they can't find her. Mm -hmm. This is why they're dwindling. Something has happened to not naturally if you keep them away. I I don't know how many people do, but if you related and liked the serpent sections the first time through, which not a lot of people do, I will say. But if you did and you like kind of sympathize with their plight and what they're looking for, it was a very cathartic moment for she who remembers to one, be released by Wintro and two, to start eating her captors. Yes. And not <laughs> abominations, only that. Abominations. Yes. <laughs> and not only that, but we finally get the answer to what the serpents are looking for. Yes. What is she who yeah. remembers supposed to be bringing them towards? Mm-hmm. What is going on? And here we have Wintro fully enmeshed in those memories so that we can learn finally what's going on. What, what their next steps exactly are. Yes. And so we get the little hint. We now know how they turn into dragons what's going on however there's still the questions of how is that going to work now is there a place for them to turn into serpents or from serpents to dragons we still don't know but we do know the big missing key why they're lost Mm -hmm, exactly and so this rescue boat pulls up beside them they get wintrow in first um they relay the information that the serpent brushed him Confusion of movement and then pain. His body had forgotten how to bend. It was too swollen. They can see that the serpent is kind of right beneath them. So they're like, hurry, get them inside this rescue boat quick. So they pull him out of the plenty and into the lack, and they dropped him onto something hard and uneven. He lay gasping, hoping his gills would not dry out before he could escape. What is that stuff on him? It stung my hands. Wash him off. Get that stuff off him, someone advised. Let's get him to the ship first. I don't think he'll last that long. At least get it off his face. Someone scrubbed at his face. It hurt. He opened his jaws and tried to roar at them. He willed toxins, but his mane would not stand. It was too painful. He slipped back from this life into the previous one. This also reminded me of something I wanted to talk about that (laughs) there's just so much happening that I sometimes forget. 
but there's a lot of blood being given given to this serpent from Wintro. Not on purpose, obviously, but when he was working on those on the bars? Yeah, on the bars of the jail. <laughs> the backs of his hands were bloody. Yeah, he his blisters reopened and he got blood over there and then he is his skin is being wiped away from the acid of this slime that he's getting on him and he keeps touching the serpent with that. And so I feel like there's a ming- like extra mingling happening and yeah. that could also be why they're connecting so strongly, mm-hmm. especially because his hands were open wounds. Right. And we know how powerful blood is. We were reminded again this chapter how powerful that is by Vivacia in the very beginning of I shared blood with Kenneth. That's why I have his memories. And so here where he's bloody, I feel like that is also part of why he is so enmeshed with She Who Remembers and why they're so entangled. And there is some sort of... So her memories are very potent. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Like she... Yeah. Obviously already has that ability, but yes, yeah. so he... He falls back into her memories once again of scarlet wings, and they're flying slightly away from a city, but mm-hmm. can see shining towers and a funnel of dragons flying over that city, and is like, well, do I go back to the city to get praised and fed, or do I go hunting? Yes. Both of them are very pleasurable. Notably, he has scarlet wings, mm-hmm. which I wanted to point out because I'm wondering... Does that mean that she who remembers is Hebe? Hebe's red, right? Yeah, but that's in the next life, not the past life. Okay, so you don't think it's connected? No, no, okay. no, no. I don't think, no, I don't think so. Because I say that because whenever we've been talking about how the serpents that are currently in the plenty have been recalling their memories, we're kind of equating that coloring that they remember with who they become. Mm, a little bit, but I didn't think so. Okay. I don't remember specifically who we're equating with that kind of in yeah, mind. They, they, it's so long ago. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But no, I feel like there's they glimpse themselves shining on whatever colored wings. And we're like, oh, so mm-hmm. that's potentially... Okay. Whoever, Tintaglia or yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. because that's a blue dragon and I Interesting. Don't know, not Tintaglia, obviously, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Centara. Centara, yes. I don't know. Just the thought that I that I had. I guess maybe he be is she who remembers. I love that idea so much. Anyway. I don't even think she who remembers survives the whole time. Maybe not. <laughs> I think she awakens memories and then dies or something. Well, one way to find out. Yeah. But anyways, uh, yeah, they're, the memory is flying by a city and just deciding, like, which ones do I go to? I could go to the people in the city who would turn out to greet um, greet me singing songs, so pleased you to honor them with a visit. Or I could go hunting, and that's a great pleasure as well. And then Wintro, Wintro, Wintro. A man's voice beating against his dream and breaking it into pieces. He stirred reluctantly. Wintro, he hears us, he moved. Wintro, the woman added her voice to the man's. That most ancient of magics, the binding of a man by the use of his name, gripped him. He was Wintro Vestrit, merely a human, and he hurt. He hurt so badly. Someone touched him, making the pain sharper. He could not escape them now. Can you hear me, boy? We're nearly to the ship. Soon we can ease the pain. Stay awake, don't give up. The ship. Vivacia. He recoiled in sudden horror. If the others were abomination, what was she? He drew in a breath. It was hard to take in air and harder to push it out as words. No, he moaned. No. We'll be on Vivacia soon. She'll help you. He could not speak. He could not beg them not to return him to the ship. Part of him still loved her despite knowing what she was. How could she, how could he bear it? Could he keep what he knew from her? For so long she had believed she was truly alive. He must not let her know that she was dead. So this is something that we did learn about um, previous ships before that the whole, you know, the whole epiphany that they are the dead 
serpents and mid metamorphosis dragons and like the shells of those things. Mm -hmm. But this is Wintrow's first time learning it. And this is maybe if you're the first time reading it through, this might be the first time you're connecting the dots to vivacious struggle with, am I alive? Am I a being? What do you believe me to be along with Wintrow's conversations about saw and relating that to, well, she is a dead thing. Right. I will say, I think that the first revelation is the ship that gets eaten by the serpents. So I don't think it's too, it's like too revolutionary in any big way. Maybe, I guess. Well, not necessarily revolutionary, but like it might be the first time that you linked those two together. Right. Okay. Okay. Because you can, you can have that ship that was eaten be like, oh, those are the plot points. That's where it fits together in the story. And this is the first time you consider the character motivations right. of like this is going to devastate vivacia yeah fair enough okay i see what you're saying yeah no and yeah that's a very fair thing and it it's really sweet that wintro doesn't want to hurt her and finally is realizing his relationship with her in a way that isn't about if she's an abomination to saw or not i guess well they've seemed According to the beginning of this, they seem pretty good together now that he's made the decision that Kenneth is fine. You know? Right. They seem like, oh, we're we're chill now. I don't know. She's still pretty (laughs) crabby towards him, it feels like, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that's just her personality. (laughs) We jump back to Edda to finish this out. um, This danger out here. Yeah. Edda is really struggling she is holding on to wintro she can't hold him too close because he has the goo on him and whenever she touches him it takes skin with his skin away with her touch so she's trying not to touch him too tightly but also wants to keep him in her lap and just awake she's trying to keep him with them right she's kind of looking around and people are struggling here they're in the middle of this storm and for one second she thinks she glimpses the marietta far offshore sails hung limp from her spars and the sunlight glinted off her decks in the next breath at a blink the rain from her lashes she told herself what she had seen was impossible so this is what i was talking about that things are weird around other island yes later on she describes that as they get closer to the ship waves seem to be coming from all sorts of directions Mm -hmm. like it's two seas kind of clashing into one another yes so this is a localized storm around this island so as you said she's kind of trying to keep wintro breathing and awake and aware and stay keep him with her basically and she's lifting her eyes could not bear to look at wintro any longer kenneth had come into her life and taught her how to be loved He had given her Wintro, and she had learned to be a friend. Now the damn serpent was going to steal that from her, just as she had discovered it. Her salt tears blended with the rain running down her face. She could not bear it. Had she learned to feel again only to have only to feel this? Could any amount of love ever be worth the pain of losing it? She could not even hold him as he died, for the slime still on him ate into her clothes and the abrasion of her skin of her touch wiped away his skin. She cradled him as loosely as she could while the ship spoke, rocked, and reared wildly and never seemed to get any closer to Vivacia. She found Kenneth staring at her. Don't let him die, he commanded her loudly. She felt impotent. She could not even tell him how helpless she felt. She saw him crouch and thought he would crawl toward the boat to help her somehow. Instead, he stood, suddenly stood, peg and foot braced, He turned his back on her and the rowers and faced into the storm that opposed them. He threw back his head to it. The wind flapped his white shirt sleeves against his arms and streamed his black, black hair out behind him. No, he roared into it. Not now. Not when I am so close. You can't have me and you can't have my ship. By Sa, by El, by Ida, by the god of fishes, by every god nameless and not. I swear you shall not have me nor mine. He held out his hands, his fingers like claws, as if he would grapple with the wind that defied him. Can it? Avesha's voice roared through the storm. 
She reached for them with wooden arms, leaning toward the small vessel as if she would tear herself loose from the ship to come to him. Her hair streamed away from her face. A wave hit her, and she took it deep enough to send green water streaming across her deck. But she rose from it, and as she came up from the trough, her hands still reached. The storm she battled threatened to sweep her away, and yet she yearned toward him, mindless of her own safety. I shall live, Kenneth bellowed suddenly into the storm. I demand it. His one hand gripped his other wrist as he pointed it into the storm. I command it, he roared. The king worked his first miracle. So this scene is, what I just read is kind of just setting the scene, to be honest. Right. It's just Kenneth being frustrated, as I mentioned, when they were still on the beach of like, this is not the way it ends. This is not how it goes out. I was destined for something more. I'm not going to die. My ship isn't going to die. I have much more to accomplish. Right. And he has been telling Etta, or he did tell Etta earlier, trust the luck. Right. When he saw Vivacia and then here and now it's very real that Wintrow is dying and it's very hard to get to Vivacia. And he's just really having a moment i want to be in his point of view to know what prompts him to act like this in front of other people i guess i can see these thoughts happening in his mind but it's kind of crazy that he does this in front of others yeah i don't know like it just again i don't want to say it feels out of character it just feels like an interesting choice well if it works he's a godly hero. If it doesn't, they're all dead anyways. True. True. <laughs> yeah. But also, what is with him holding on to the... The charm? The by charm. his luck. Ah, uh, true. I was wondering if maybe it had been whispering, you're going to die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he was holding it be. to shut it up. <laughs> could be. That's what really sent him over the yes. edge of, I'm not dying. <laughs> true. <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> well, the king worked his first miracle. From the depths of the very sea that opposed him, the creature rose to his command. The serpent rose at the stern of the vessel, adding a roar to his, at a shrank down, and the sea serpent, vast beast though she was, bent her head to Kenneth's will. She made deep obeisance to him as he stood in the bow defying the storm. He turned toward her at the sailor's voices. Face white and taut, he pointed at her wordlessly. His mouth was open, but either he said nothing to the creature or the wind blew his words away. Later, the rowers would tell the rest of the crew that however it was he commanded her, it was not for human ears to hear. She set her broad, serpent's brow to the stern of the boat and pushed. Suddenly, the small boat was cutting through the water toward the vivacia. Kennet, exhausted by his this display of power, sank suddenly down to his seat in the bow. Etta dared not look at him. His face shone with something, an emotion that perhaps only the god touched could feel. This is crazy coincidence. Yes. It's... I know. <laughs> like, all I could think is, can it for sure is just open mouth staring and pointing at this. Yeah, he's just like, like, what? He is not commanding it to do anything he is not i tried to like play with the idea that maybe he was like get us back or something even in his head but i truly believe his open mouth point is a look of dumbfoundedness yes and me too. because it ends up working out fine and the serpent ends up pushing them to safety everybody's like whoa king kenneth he's so amazing well and he believes in himself too yeah yeah, he believes it. Why wouldn't he? Yeah. He believes in himself. He commanded the serpents. With less. And it yeah. worked. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. And all of this because Wintrow made choices. It's Wintrow should be king of the pirates <laughs> because he's the one doing all the actual stuff. I don't know. Do you think it's just Wintrow's connection with the serpent that makes the serpent save him? Yes. Interesting. Because the serpent was like, sorry, I killed you. Ha ha ha. I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, but but that was also at the start when Wintro kind of was going to leave it for dead anyway. True, true. And then it made and, more effort to defend the serpent. and Yeah, and okay. kept helping. And it did say, I'll remember you forever, breathless, mm. oh, you of little breath. And he's like, my yeah. name's Wintro. 
That's true. Yeah, I, I settled on that as well. It's just the connection with Wintro. I also played around in my mind with it could be Wintro's shared connection with Kennet through Vivacia and, you know, Kennet's plea and Wintro being like, save me and save Kennet. Kennet is a man of sci, believe in this man or whatever. Right. Kind of all those pleas together pushed the serpent over the edge to help. But yeah, I honestly just think it's the connection with Wintro. So yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's just that. Yeah. And I mean, it's hard to tell because we're not back in Wintro's point of view. It's hard to tell if Wintro was pleading or anything. Yeah. If yeah. he said, please help us get back or thought anything at all, or if the serpent just recognized the situation, because again, it is mm-hmm. an intelligent creature yeah. and can probably figure out what's going on. But either way, it has helped. And Kenneth looks like a god. Yes. And Edda is in awe. And also I feel as though it kind of gives the vibe of she's this feeling, man now? Yeah, she's kind of ashamed of looking down on him or not maybe not looking down, but doubting him in any way. Right. Because clearly he is God touched. <laughs> Where the uh, serpent is touching the boat, the boat is starting to fall apart, and the serpent is just forcing this boat through the waves. Not like riding along top of it, it's just like, we're plowing you through the ocean to get to the ship. Right, (laughs) right. The vivacious plunged doggedly toward them, and there was a moment when the two oceans seemed to collide in turmoil. There was no pattern to wave nor winds. The breath of the world lashed them, threatening to snatch the clothes from their bodies and the hair from their heads. Etta felt deafened by the onslaught, but the serpent inexorably pushed the tiny boat on. Then they were suddenly in the same wind and the same current. Joyously, both sea and air caught at them and conspired with the serpent to bring them together. The wind and current that Vivacia opposed swept their small boat toward her reaching arms. Vivacia took a wave hard, but... As Vivacia came up, it had swamped her briefly. Her great arms cupped and held the helpless boat. She rose from the wave with it clasped to her. Etta had never been so close to the figurehead. As she bore them up out of the deep, her voice boomed out over them. Thank you, thank you, a thousand blessings upon you, sister of the sea. Thank you. Silver tears of joy streamed down the live ship's carved face and fell like jewels into the water. Now they're saved. Are these silver tools skill? Pure Tears. skill. Yeah, it's art. Yeah. Are I these... don't I don't think so. Okay. Maybe maybe skill touched or something because like Wizardwood has mm-hmm. skill in it, but I don't think it's like pure skill or anything like that. Okay. Also crazy she can cry. Yeah. But also like if it was pure skill, they would just be absorbed back into the Wizardwood cuz that thing is wants pure skill. True. However, my argument would be crying. Your body wants water. Yeah. And whenever she's you cry, got a lot of salt water <laughs> absorbed into her wood. Okay, sure. <laughs> she can whatever. squeeze some out. <laughs> I'm going to continue to believe that it's pure skill. but <laughs> Well, they get up into Vivacious hands. And for as the crewmen reach down to lay hands upon uh, on him, on Kennet, and haul him on board. The great green and gold serpent rose from the storming depths and gazed upon him. Yeah, I'm sure it gazed upon Kennet only. Mm-hmm. Etta felt gripped by that whirling gold stare. She looked into the depths of the creature's eyes and almost knew something. Then the creature roared one final time and sank back into the suddenly calming depths. So yeah, the whole... Everyone on... That small boat was raised into vivacious hands, and then the serpent, of course, rises up and stares at Kennet, because Kennet is the one who commanded it. Right. <laughs> it's definitely looking to make sure Wintro got on. <laughs> right. Etta felt herself and Wintro cradled in the ship's hands as Vivacia let the useless pieces of wood fall away. The ship li- herself lifted them to where eager hands gripped them and pulled them aboard. Gently, gently... Etta cried as they seized Wintrow from her arms. Bring fresh water. Cut his clothes away. Pour over him water and wine. Then, then... Vivacia suddenly cried aloud in wonder. She clasped her steaming hands together as if she prayed. I know you, she cried out abruptly. I know you. And Etta passes out. Right. So, the reason 
Vivacia screaming out that she knows it the has serpent. steaming hands. Yes, it's because she, she touched Wintrow and the slime, the goo. From the boat, too, yeah. Yes. Also the boat. I figured it was probably more from how covered Wintrow is. But either way, she has touched the poison mm-hmm. that gives serpents their Remnants, memories. Yeah. And she recognizes the serpent. Mm-hmm. And, and be- herself. And herself. And before Edda passes out, we have Kenneth there to cup her face and say, I have it from here. Then she passes out because he'll take care of it. Kenneth had follows, followed Edda's advice about Wintrow for lack of any better. The boy, loosely wrapped in a length of linen, now slept in his own bed. Breath whistled in and out of him. He was ghastly. His entire body was so swollen as to be almost shapeless. The skin had blistered and bubbled up from his body. The slime had eaten through his clothing and then melted skin and fabric together. In washing him, great patches of his skin had sloughed away, leaving raw, red stretches of flesh. Kenneth suspected it was good that he was unconscious. Otherwise, the pain would have been terrible. Kenneth rose stiffly. He had been sitting at the foot of his bed, and now that the storm was over, he had time to think things through, but he would not. Some things were not to be carefully considered. He would not ask Vivacia how she had known that she must abandon her post in Deception Cove and seek him out. He would not question what the serpent had done. He would not try to change the groveling deference the crew was currently showing him. There was a tap, and Etta entered. Her eyes went to Wintrow, then back to Kennet. I have a bath waiting for you. And then her words halted. She looked at him as if she did not know what name to call him by. He had to smile at that. This is like the best day of Kenneth's life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, and, and not just because of the power it afforded him, but because to him, this is true, true recognition of the world that he is destined to be great. Yes. He truly thinks he commanded that serpent. Yeah. Maybe not like... Maybe not like, oh, I spoke its language and told it to do this, but he... It's his luck. Yeah, his luck, his his force of will. I command I command the world not to kill me, basically, mm-hmm. and then the serpent saved them. So he's like, I mean, maybe Wintro's right. <laughs> maybe I am God. Yeah. <laughs> one of many, one of the many faces of Saw yeah, in exactly. the flesh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am a tool of Saw here. No. Yeah. So yeah, this is the best day of Kenneth's life, and Kenneth's just like, yeah, good. Yeah. Keep watch here with him. You know, do whatever you think is wise to make him easy. I can manage my bath by myself. Etta is kind of uneasy. Doesn't really know what to. Not really uneasy, but doesn't know what to say to Kenneth. Right. So she's just kind of going through the motions of the normal routine of just like, yep, got a bath for you. I put out dry clothes for you. Sorkor's aboard asking to see you. I didn't know what to say to him. The lookout told him what he saw and Sorkor was going to have him flogged because he was lying. But then I told him he wasn't. So she just kind of trails off. Right. And he looks at her. She stares at him. Her breath came short and fast. And what else? He prompted her gently. She moistened her lips and held out her hand. This was in my boot. When I changed, I think it must have come from the other's island. She held out her hands toward him. Cupped in them, no bigger than a quail's egg, was a baby. The infant was curled tight in sleep, eyes closed, lashes on his cheeks, tiny round knees drawn up to his chest. Whatever it was carved from mimicked perfectly the fresh pink of young flesh. A tiny serpentine tail wrapped its body. What does it mean? Ada demanded, her voice quavering. Kenneth touched it with a fingertip, his weathered skin dark against it. I think we both know, don't we? He asked her solemnly. And Etta is pregnant. Is she? Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I thought she gets pregnant after this. I didn't know I she's like currently pregnant. I guess we don't know for sure. Okay. <laughs> Like, I thought this was, like, the push she needed to be, like, it's time for a baby. Oh, right, because she still has the navel thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's... Probably. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe she is. We'll find out. 
But the second miracle. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, a lot happens in this chapter. It does. It's so much, but it's so interesting in a way that sometimes the long chapters aren't. <laughs> this is a long chapter. Are you kidding no, me? This no, is almost I'm saying- thirty pages. It's interesting. A lot of the other long chapters, similar in length, Mm -hmm. are a little less interesting, though just as dense. Yeah. And I found this a lot more... Because it's action. Remember we talked about this. Yeah. Something is happening and it's like an action scene. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel as long when your politics, talk, emotional character moment, switch perspectives, different location, intro to location... Politics, talk, character moment, yes. switch again. Yeah. <laughs> this is just back and forth, back to back to back. Like, what's going to happen next? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good chapter. Very much appreciate this one. Yeah. Um, things, as we've, we've kept mentioning it, things are kind of wrapping up. There's probably, what, uh, six more chapters? Mm-hmm. I think the total of 40. And next one is 35. So, yeah, getting close to the end here. Next one, we jump over to uh, Malta point yes. of view again. And since months have passed, they are in the rain wilds at that point. Yes. And she yeah. is on the mend as well, which, which kind of, you know, perfectly lines up in a, uh, a plotted out novel kind of way. Both Malta and Wintro get injured. They have time to recover. And now they can go back on doing things. And there was some sort of danger in there. For yes, them. exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you have anything, uh, any thoughts about this chapter as a whole or this half of the chapter, please let us know. You can email us at isfitshappy at gmail.com or, of course, you can message us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Threads, uh, YouTube, on all of those. We're on Reddit as well. We comment once in a while. We're at Is Fitz Happy on all of those platforms. So feel free to message, to comment on threads, whatever you want to do. Send us memes. Send us pictures of your animals, uh, <laughs> pictures of your pets. <laughs> whatever you feel like sending us. Exactly. As long as it's not a death threat. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. <laughs> that was a bit much. Sorry. <laughs> it's late where we are. <laughs> yeah, it's very late where we are. Plus... Uh, as a clarification, we have not gotten any one of those. No, so no. I don't know why I said that. Yeah. We can cut that out, actually. <laughs> thank Just you. send us hate mail. <laughs> yes. Uh, so thank you so much for everything that you guys send us. Uh, we look always look forward to reading it and uh, commenting on it. Yeah. Can't wait to see what you guys say next week. Okay, now we're back to, or up to, (laughs) my favorite part, which is hearing what you guys have to say and your thoughts on the episodes and the series. We're going to start with some comments we got from Dagenhart on Facebook that are about episode... 194. Yes. So the previous episode here, uh, chapter 33, Proofs. And most of the comments are about um, rain and a couple other like comments regarding some of the uh, the other emails that we got sent in and discussed from that episode. Yeah. So specifically what we're going to talk about is the Degenhart's ideas on rain Mm -hmm. and how his intentions may be noble, but his intentions do not justify the means. Dagenhart says, I too think the Vestrits would be safest up the Rainwild River, but that does not excuse him not taking the five minutes to explain why, instead of invoking the blood debt while laughing maniacally. <laughs> From my previous readings, I remembered Rain as a nice guy, but now he seems more like a nice guy TM. <laughs> which, yes, absolutely. I 100% agree with that take, uh, which probably isn't very surprising. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I... I don't know. It is really annoying that he is so, I don't know, weird about it. Like, why do, Why doesn't he just take five seconds to explain anything? Gotta have that miscommunication, I guess. Gotta have the miscommunication. And I, I'm going to go back to my explanation in that episode discussion. He came from fighting and, like, desperate chances to come and save the family. And that save 
safe passage might leave at any moment. So he's like, we got to go now. Right. I don't know. It, well, he could have given any more context while he was looking for Malta. Right. He could yeah. have been explaining as he went. Mm-hmm. He did not need to be like, I he claim also, this blood debt. He also heard that thing, something that he orchestrated hurt the person he loves. So he's like, oh, my God, Malta, where are you? Malta. Yeah, because he <laughs> gave her no context and it just added yeah, without thinking. Yeah. yeah. So again, he should feel bad. Rom com stuff, maybe. Yeah. He also doesn't feel bad enough, in my opinion. Also How do you know that? <laughs> How do you know that, huh? I, I think you just like to hate him. Well, I'm a hater. So <laughs> Thank you, Degan Hart, for that. <laughs> Thank you. And also, just a quick shout out because Degan Hart said the real reason why I was reading this book is my fiercely burning hatred for Barrel Guy, which is true. <laughs> it does keep me powered through. So that's why I <laughs> kept with the series. <laughs> Thanks, Degan Hart. We also got an email from uh, Mati. I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, hopefully. Uh, Matthias. Thank you for messaging us. You're a new fan. You're on episode 50, so you'll hear this in 140 episodes yes. about. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for for writing in. Hope you have some uh, some theories by the time you hear this that yes. you can share with us. We're excited to hear them. And then finally, we are going to end on an email from listener Jonas, who is talking about the section of last week's episode that has a content warning on it. So before we get into it, content warning, this will be talking about what happens to Althea and the sexual assault that happens there. Obviously is not going to go very in depth because it's just about our discussion. Yes. So we won't be really talking details, but it is about that topic. So if you do not want to hear about it at all, totally fine we are done after this you are not missing anything (laughs) (laughs) so be good to yourself thanks for tuning in if you're turning it off right now yes but now we're gonna talk about the email so jonas wrote in to talk about how this section of what happens to althea is a really good example to them about how good of a writer Robin Hobb is that it doesn't feel like what is happening to Althea is gratuitous. It's more realistic and it really yeah. is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to read and it is, but very, it's done so well that it hurts good in a weird way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Of like, it's just hitting that spot of being realistic enough to where you're feeling for the character and you are happy that she prevails and that she gets, you know, the upper hand. And Jonas mentions that he can't imagine being in the, in Althea's place where she finally breaks off her attacker's teeth and doesn't just run away. Like that's what Jonas would want to do. That's what I'd want to do. Yeah. And instead she stays and she makes a bigger point and mm-hmm. handles in, him competently, drags him up on deck. Yes. And in doing so gets the upper hand for all the other people on deck and gives mm-hmm. herself a better reputation and shows that she is capable to these less than stellar men that she yeah. has to work with. And uh, Jonas says that, Honestly, I think her anger just outweighed her fear as soon as he was down, and that's why she did what she did. Yeah. Which, yeah, I mean... I would agree. And, like, yeah, obviously we know why she was angry, so... I don't know. I think it was really well said, just that it's a hard topic, but it is done really well. Mm -hmm. The other part of his email is discussing what happens on deck... Jonas thinks that Brash and giving the opportunity to the first mate to take control feels kind of bad, but maybe it's just the chain of command on a ship. I don't, I don't know about that. I kind of disagree with it. Even Brashen seems to kind of apologize for that moment of overstepping. Right. Because I feel like it would be Lavoie's, if, if it seemed out of hand, it would be Lavoie's job to then step in and then it would be brashen's job to step in if it was still an issue and not brashen kind of overstepping and being like hey take care of it and take it off of althea's hands um 
But Jonas also kind of talks that, yeah, it feels bad for Althea, but, you know, maybe it's fine. And the actual act of Lavoie kind of conceding Althea's, like, authority over the situation did feel very cathartic, though, at the same time, which definitely I agree with. It kind of gives her that extra respect of, like, you can handle this, right? And she's like, yeah, definitely. And she does. Yeah. So very good points brought up. Yeah, Jonas says that she's grown a lot already since we first saw her, running up and down the decks of the Vivacia, defying Kyle every chance she got. Which is true. She was not a sailor when we yeah. first saw her. She thought of herself as the best sailor ever. Uh, and she was getting scolded for just redoing the cargo in the uh, in the hold, like how her father taught her instead of how the captain wanted. Right. And... Uh, didn't do anything else no. that day. <laughs> uh, I have a question. After seeing this, I, it did make me have a question. Do you think this version of Althea would have gotten along with Kyle? No, because I think deep down Althea will always see somebody coming in and taking over for her father as taking over for her father and stepping into his place, you know? And yeah. I think she would always kind of resent that. But would she have defied him as openly? Like, would he have had as much of a problem mm, with her? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think they they would have been tolerable to one another, but I don't think they would have liked one another either way because Kyle doesn't like women. True. Women in places of work, I guess I should say. <laughs> yeah. And Althea doesn't like chauvinistic men fair yeah <laughs> so <laughs> and dickheads she doesn't yeah. like dickheads either so it's that handshake emoji of yep. like not liking each other <laughs> yes exactly so i think they could have tolerated the the sailing ship that trip that they did and things could have worked out better and they wouldn't have had the you know the spitting hatred at one another and she would have been locked in her room but i still don't think they would have liked one another i think he still would have kicked her off the boat he was going to put Wintro on no matter what. I don't think he would have, kept, mm. you know, and maybe he would have kept her until Selden was old enough to take over. Yeah. I feel like something like that would have happened more so because if she was amenable, if she was somewhat competent, then he wouldn't have had as much of an excuse. But the whole th- shouting match made Ronica convince Efren to sign it over, you know? Right. Well, not just that. It happened before that. But, but. you know, like just the whole defiance that she had been giving Kyle for a long time before the book even started. Right. (laughs) It was what convinced Ronica to be like, no, 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 this is what's best. (laughs) So, yeah, I don't know. Interesting topic. Yeah. What ifs, I guess. So thank you, Jonas, for bringing that up and letting us talk. And thank you, everybody else who wrote in. It's always great to hear from you guys. And we love seeing what you guys think and what your thoughts are so we look forward to seeing what else you bring to our attention next week 